Good evening, everyone. Good to see you all again. I'm Senator Ed Markey. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone who has joined us this evening. Um, let's be careful out there. We've already lost 140,000 people. We have a racist president who also happens to be criminally negligent in everything he's doing. So we just have to protect ourselves and in that way we protect essential workers. So uh, please, please do everything you can to uh, let Massachusetts be uh, the brain state that will we'll set the model. Uh, and, uh, and so what we know is that uh, we have faced plenty of unknowns in 2020, but one that remains is the long-term effects of COVID-19 on our health and our bodies. We have seen over the past few months, people fall sick and two weeks later seem to fully recover. We have seen those who have been hospitalized for months and beautiful homecomings as they are rolled out to reunite with their families. But what about those who haven't recovered, who remain ill, fatigued, or bedridden? Dr. Fauci has identified these people as having possible cases of ME-CFS, a chronic debilitating multi-system illness that affects the immune uh, uh, neurologic, vascular, respiratory, and the body's energy producti production system. Uh, this disease takes away the quality of life of its victims. Those who have it, <coughs> excuse me, cannot lead normal lives and are oftentimes bedridden for years. And we face the coronavirus pandemic. It is absolutely essential that we invest in the research and protect the unassuming lives uh, who uh, who may be hit with this chronic condition. That's why I am fighting to add $60 million over four years for NIH research funding to study ME-CFS in future coronavirus relief. We know that research <clears throat> is medicine's field of dreams from which we harvest the findings that give hope to families. And today I am joined by four incredible advocates who know this to be true, advocates for ME-CFS, patients and advocates for health justice. First, I am joined by the incredible activists who first informed me of this debilitating disease in 2017. Rivka Solomon bravely fought her fatigue to stand up and ask me to commit to funding MECFS research at a town meeting in Northampton in 2017. Mm -hmm. And since then, <clears throat> I have worked closely with her to improve recognition of the disease and more importantly, secure research funding Ripka has suffered from this disease for 30 years. Also joining me is Ashanti Daniel, a former registered nurse and single mother who was thrust into the world of ME-CFS when she faced a sudden onset after becoming ill with a virus nearly four years ago. I'm also joined by Jamel Aguilar, a clinical social worker and academic who studies the intersection of social work and public health Approximately 20 years ago, Jamel struggled with pain and fatigue and became one of the millions living with ME-CFS. And finally, finally, <clears throat> Claudia Carrera, an academic and activist holding degrees from Princeton and NYU, who has, who has been researching HIV, AIDS, uh, and, the, and was in activism when ME-CFS put her career on hold. A Massachusetts resident, she is a national advocate for health justice for people with ME-CFS across the country. So I'd ask each of you um, to um, introduce yourself and to tell your personal story uh, and uh, love to hear it. And, uh, and, and if you could keep each of those to two minutes, then we can go on and have a very, I think, productive uh, an interesting conversation for everyone, the thousands of people who are watching this this evening. So Rivka, we'll begin with you. Well, thank you, Senator Markey. Thank you so much for inviting us to share about our lives. Living with this disability and this chronic illness of ME-CFS, myalgic encephalomyelitis. The first thing I wanna say, Senator Markey, is I'm a huge fan of yours. Um, I've been proudly voting for you for decades. And of course, the last few years, you've been our champion on Capitol Hill. So tonight, as you said, we're gonna do two rounds. The first will be personal stories and the second will dive into a few topics like racial inequality, misdiagnosis, lack of research funding, and how the disease COVID-19 relates to ME-CFS. So I'm starting and um, I have four minutes to start and I will tell you briefly some facts about ME-CFS and my own story 
of ME and then uh, how you are fighting for us on Capitol Hill. So some facts, basic facts. Uh, the disease is called myalgic encephalomyelitis slash chronic fatigue syndrome. Most patients just call it ME. Uh, ME is severe, chronic, it's debilitating. It's got neurological and immunological symptoms. Uh, we're totally depleted. We have no energy to the point that we often can't function. Our brains are foggy. We have trouble thinking. We have non-restorative sleep and we may have chronic pain. But the biggest takeaway out of all this, Senator Markey, is that we have an energy production impairment on the cellular level. And even small tasks, small tasks can make us significantly worse for days or months. Um, so there's up to two and a half million of us in the United States, up to 60 million in Massachusetts, and over 20 million around the globe. Three quarters of us are women, one quarter are homebound and bedridden, and uh, a half to two thirds are too sick to work. We have no FDA approved treatments, no cure. Many doctors dismiss us, they don't believe that we're sick, and Emmy is rarely taught in med school. So doctors don't know how to diagnose us, they don't know how to treat us. And uh, so we're, many of us, 90% about are left undiagnosed. And the last fact I wanna mention is that um, the National Institutes of Health, unfortunately has been significantly underfunding ME-CFS research for decades and we have felt abandoned. Uh, my personal story is that I got mono. I got mononucleosis in college from the Epstein-Barr virus. Two of my roommates and I all got sick at the same time. They got better in a month and I never got better. I went from being an active young adult, working, going to school, swimming three times a week, and uh, to being so sick I could barely stand up and brush my teeth. My illness did go into remission for a couple of years, but it came back and in total, like you said, I've spent 30 years in or near bed and I am moderately sick. So severe patients are so sick they can't feed or bathe themselves sometimes, and that can go on for years. And lastly, I just wanna say the role that you have played in my life, Senator Markey, and in the life of our community. So Senator Markey, you are an amazing fighter for people with disabilities. In 2017, I left my sick bed to go see you in the town hall meeting in Northampton. I, got, I, I stood up from my wheelchair for a second, then plopped back down, and I asked you to please help people with ME. And without hesitating, you said, I will advocate for you. And the crowd of about a thousand people cheered and I wanted to cry because we'd been invisible for so long. No one in the Senate was paying attention to us until you stepped up and did that. And since then you've been working tirelessly on raising awareness for MECFS. And currently now you're fighting, as you said, to get more research money for MECFS and post COVID illness in the upcoming coronavirus package. And that's because a lot of the symptoms that we're seeing, as Dr. Fauci said, in post-COVID illness look a lot like MECFS. So Senator Markey, you've been an amazing advocate for disabled, pe disabled people and we are forever grateful and you fought for us and now we wanna fight for you. Thank you so much, Rivka. So Ashanti, would love to hear Hello. from you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ashanti Daniel. Like you already stated, I am a registered nurse, though I'm disabled, and a single mother who was also a fitness enthusiast before myalgic encephalomyelitis slash chronic fatigue syndrome, also known as ME or MECFS, <coughs> came along like an invisible thief in the night nearly four years ago, following a viral illness and bulldozed the life I once had the plans I made, the career I loved wholeheartedly. I went from working out five days a week, being so healthy and fit that I was often asked if I was a trainer, to being bedridden 90 to 95% of the time and needing assistance just to get to my bathroom, which is connected to my bedroom. This was at my lowest point. I have been unable to shower standing since becoming ill. And even though I shower sitting down on a shower chair, my heart races at 140 to 150 beats per minute. For context, normal adult heart rate at rest is 60 to 100 beats per minute. Let that sink in for a second. One of the hardest parts of this disease is that it inhibits my ability to be the mother I once was and would have been had this disease not turned our world upside down. I say our because not only does it impact me, but it impacts my children and really everyone who loves me. <clears throat> Pre-illness, I never missed a baseball game my son was playing in. If he had a game at 8 a.m. and I worked the night prior, I was a night shift nurse, 
in case you didn't guess, <laughs> I would get off work at 7.30 a.m. and go straight to the baseball field without a nap or anything. If he had games in the evening and I had to work that night, I'd be at the game in my scrubs, stay until the last minute, just make it to work on time. I had to be there to support my baby. In 2018, I believe that was the year, one of the years that I've been ill, I only was able to make it to less than five of my son's baseball games. So my son was playing baseball every weekend. There are 52 weeks in a year. I was only able to make it to less than five games. It's been a total nightmare. It's devastating, not only to me, but to my son. And as a single mother, if I'm not there to support him, nobody is. Although my son may quote, understand why I was not able to be there, or even now sometimes still I'm not able to be there, it does not make my absence at his games feel any better to him. His illness has robbed me of so much, so very much. I mean, I could go on and on, but in the <clears throat> interest of time, I'm gonna cut it there and just know that we appreciate you so much, Senator Markey, for fighting for us. We need you, we appreciate you, thank you. Thank you, Ashanti, very much. Thank you for telling the story. Uh, and Jamel, are you out there, Jamel? I'm here. Beautiful. Here. My name is Dr. Jamal Aguilar. I have a PhD um, and I am a clinical social worker. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, how I became part of this community. Basically 20 years ago, I got sick, I had mono. Um, my doctor at the time said it will pass. And eight months later, nine months later, one year later, I had been in the hospital two times. They said it was starting to clear up, but 20 years later, I still see, feel the same fatigue and pain that I experienced um, at that moment. And to, just to give you an idea of the pain that I'm talking about is it's like having acid running underneath your skin on a bad day and on a good day, everything just hurts, including your hair. And I say that because I tell my students, um, I still, uh, I'm able to teach because I have to support myself. I tell my students some days, I'm just not gonna be able to pull it together. I'm gonna sit in front of the class and do the best I can. I forget words. It's very difficult for me to be able to have the active life of um, an academic. So I have to start <coughs> out. But also, um, when I've gone to the doctor, I have gone, I estimated about 50 doctors over the last 20 years and have been insulted by about 49 of them about this disease and talked about everything from how it is that um, I might have an undiagnosed mental health um, problem to I'm just faking it to my favorite narcolepsy, told that I might have nar narcolepsy. Yet each time um, I ended up taking more time from that doctor to avoid going to another one. And so over the last 20 years, it has been a struggle um, to just get the basic respect and treatment that I need. And when I saw that um, Senator Markey was advocating for a bill that would bring money to this disease, <sighs> I related it for the first time, I feel like I'm being recognized that what I'm experiencing every day is something that's worthwhile of research, which I do, interestingly enough. Now, I want to leave you with a number, and the number is 22. That is how many pills I take every day so that I can be functional. 22 pills throughout the day. Remember that, 22. Thank you. Incredible. That is incredible, Jamel. Incredible. Thank you for telling your story. Uh, Claudia, Claudia, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Beautiful. Um, thanks please, so tell, please tell us your story. Sure, thanks so much for your introduction. Um, so I've actually had symptoms of ME-CFS from a young age, but I didn't realize it because they were at a mild level at that point. And I was young, so I just thought everybody felt the way that I did, but managed to push through it better than me. So while I was growing up here in Massachusetts, going to school, <clears throat> Day, and then in college and in the workplace, I always struggled to do like a quarter of what my peers were able to do. And I just thought that I wasn't working hard enough. And nobody around me understood either because they all said, you know, like, but, you know, you're intelligent, like, your work product is good when you 
get to put it out, what's going on? And I didn't have an answer. Um, and so I thought I wasn't working hard enough when in reality it was physically costing me much more to do much less. So it wasn't until a few years ago while I was doing a PhD that my condition got a lot worse and I was diagnosed with ME-CFS. And I essentially had, like many people, had to diagnose myself by, by looking for information online because <clears throat> didn't guide me there and then once I kind of figured out that this fit my symptom pattern I found an MECFS doctor who then did diagnose me but anyway I tried really hard to stay in my PhD program because I was really really passionate about my dissertation <clears throat> on HIV AIDS art and activism and I cut literally every other thing out of my life so I could put all my energy towards that but still, I ultimately had to go on medical leave and move back in with my parents here in Massachusetts as a 35-year-old. And, well, sorry, I'm 35 now. That was as a 34-year-old. Now I spend almost all my time in bed, and I do active advocacy and activism from there. Um, I usually, and only for a few hours a day, because that's all I can handle, if that. Um, I, I usually only leave the house for doctor's appointments. I, as, as Rivka had mentioned, um, I, you know, I struggle to even bathe myself because it takes up so much energy that I end up dead for two days and everything is a constant balancing act of should I do this or should I save the energy for this other thing? You have to choose. Um, and I'm, I'm just missing out on so much that I see my friends and my sisters accomplishing. They have um, beautiful families. Uh, they are advancing their careers, winning awards, starting businesses. And meanwhile, I'm, I'm stuck in bed. Uh, you know, now everyone else with quarantine has a sense of what that, what's that like, but normally we're, we're in our bedrooms by ourselves. Um, so, so that's my story. Wow, Claudia, thank you for telling us your story. Uh, can you speak, Claudia, a little bit about why this disease has been put in the shadows for so long from your perspective? Sure, so, um, so the way it started is actually in, in the 1980s, well, I think I'll start by saying that the, our federal health agencies and the medical community have just really severely <clears throat> MECFS for over three decades, but it goes beyond that. So until just a few years ago, MECFS was actually actively stigmatized by these groups. Um, they mischaracterized it as either yuppie flu or yuppie burnout or a psychogenic illness caused by false beliefs or even mass hysteria. So this caused major harm to MECFS patients uh, who were and continue to be prescribed counterproductive treatments, but it also harmed MECFS researchers who were denied funding and employment opportunities because they weren't studying a real disease, supposedly, which of course then forced most of them to move into different research fields. And, and so now over the last five years or so, the NIH and CDC have finally acknowledge that MECFS is a biological disease and they've taken some initial steps to encourage researchers to return to the field. And so that alone is a big deal. But unfortunately, there's been no <clears throat> an adequate response commensurate with the <clears throat> prevalence and devastation of the disease, nor has there been any serious effort to rectify the problems that these agencies created over their three decades of denial. And so now with countless COVID long haulers developing symptoms of ME and no infrastructure for either research or clinical care, we're really in a crisis situation. And it's really frustrating because if our federal agencies had listened to MECFS advocates five years ago and committed to making real progress, we would likely have diagnostic testing and adequate clinical care by this point, or at least widespread awareness. And of course, if research had begun back in the 1980s, when multiple, multiple sclerosis, when, when the CDC was called to um, an outbreak for the first time, and which is when multiple sclerosis research began in earnest, we would no doubt have treatments by now, or maybe even a cure. <clears throat> and so instead, we're now faced with this like potential wave of new people becoming disabled with no care or support. And that's just not acceptable. So, so now our federal health, health agencies need to mount a warp speed effort to find treatments for the millions with existing and new ME, commensurate with the efforts and resources being put towards acute COVID to ensure that no COVID survivor is left behind. And I'm so grateful, uh, Senator Markey, that, that you are leading this effort to, uh, to, to start with a commitment of $15 million a year for four years to finally make a real contribution to the research program that's still in its early stages. 
Thank you, Claudia, so much. So let's follow up on Claudia's point about perhaps a new way of MECFS. Uh, and Rivka, maybe you could speak to so, how viral in, uh, viral illnesses can bring on MECFS and how that relates to those suffering with COVID-19 right now and what Dr. Fauci is talking about. Right. So, Senator Markey, you are exactly right. And Claudia, of course, is as well. So 80% of people with ME uh, got ME after a viral or bacterial infection. And in, that was my story. I got mono from the Epstein-Barr virus. And research shows that after <clears throat> every viral epidemic, some remain sick with ME-CFS-like symptoms. So that includes West Nile virus, which we hear a lot about here in Massachusetts, H1N1, SARS, MERS, all of those were viral epidemics that uh, then ended up leaving some percentage of people with ME-CFS-like symptoms. And COVID is from the coronavirus. And so getting the coronavirus or COVID-19, there are a lot of people who aren't getting better. And Fauci, uh, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci said three times last week, that these long haulers or long COVID patients, uh, they're showing symptoms that look like ME-CFS, intense exhaustion, uh, cognitive and neurological difficulties, and what we call post-exertional malaise or post-exertion exhaustion, where it takes an extraordinary amount of time to recover, even after doing small tasks. And the media has just been exploding with these stories about long haulers and, and with ME-CFS-like symptoms including including CNN's Chris Cuomo. Um, so he came on air and said his doctor is talking with him about MECFS. Um, we, know, we don't know what, what's going on there. We're not saying that he has that, but he just said that his doctor is talking about that. And I just wanna say one more thing, which is that we hope that all these COVID long haulers get better. We completely are rooting for them to get better. But there are some tips that will help for getting better if you're experiencing ME-CFS-like symptoms. One of them is that you should believe yourself. If you feel too sick to work, too sick to get out of bed, believe yourself. Don't let anyone tell you you're making it up and don't push yourself because if you do, it can have severe repercussions and that's what I did. I pushed myself and I became disabled for 30 years. You should pace yourself, rest between <clears throat> and be very, very, very careful about exercise because we have an energy production impairment. Thank you. So, uh, Ashanti, if you, could you speak to the racial inequality issues around ME, CFS, and COVID-19? Sure. So, of course, it is no secret that COVID-19 is disproportionately impacting Black people in America. For instance, Senator, in your state of Massachusetts, Black people make up 9% of the state's population, but 25% of Boston's population. Honing in on Boston, since that is the city in which Massachusetts' Black population is most concentrated, as of April this year, 40.3% of people who tested <coughs> positive for COVID in Boston are Black. And that percentage does not include the number of Black people that do not trust the healthcare system and opt out of testing as a result. Also keep in mind that data is from April and the numbers have increased since. The exact statistics as of today are not yet available, unfortunately, so this is what we have. Additionally, I'd like to add, I have read countless articles about disparities surrounding COVID and the treatment of Black people in doctor's offices, emergency rooms, hospitals, et cetera. But one stood out the most to me. It was about a Black woman who was a nurse, just like me. However, she was working and started developing symptoms of COVID. So she went to the ER at the hospital where she was employed. She went to the ER multiple times with these <coughs> COVID symptoms and was sent home every time. The final time she was sent home, sadly, that nurse died of COVID. Had she been a white woman, this nurse would not have been treated this poorly. These are just a few examples of many nationwide that demonstrate the fact that Black people are at greater risk of being impacted by COVID health-wise. While keeping that fact in mind, let's switch gears a little and talk about the quote COVID long haulers. In light of the fact that some of the COVID long haulers, many whom will likely be Black based on the current statistics, 
in light of the fact that they may eventually meet the diagnostic criteria for an NECFS diagnosis, we must talk about the elephant in the room, structural racism. Structural racism is the historical and contemporary policies, practices, and norms that create and maintain white supremacy. As it stands right now, Black people with MECFS, a disease that has historically been perceived to be a, quote, white woman's disease, struggle to get diagnosed. Let's look at why, while keeping in mind that we will possibly be adding a significant number of Black COVID long haulers to a healthcare system that is already inherently biased towards us. The COVID-19 pandemic illustrates the intersection of structural racism and health and highlights why we need to address structural racism now. Structural racism is the common denominator and underlying condition fueling disparities in COVID-19 and preventing Black people from being diagnosed with MECFS. Due to time constraints, I cannot delve into all of the many layers of structural racism. However, let me make it clear that structural racism is a public health <gasps> crisis. Let me say that again. Structural racism is a public health crisis. In a study recently published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences Journal, 50%, that's half, of white medical students and residents hold false beliefs about biological differences between Black and white people. This is frightening, as these are the doctors of our future. In addition to implicit bias, which is subconscious prejudice, as demonstrated by those statistics, structural factors that limit disease prevention and treatment have directly contributed to Black Americans bearing a higher burden of chronic disease than white Americans. While we hopefully work towards tackling the public health crisis that is structural racism, we need to at least increase research funding for MECFS especially since there is very likely going to be an influx of people presenting with lingering MECFS-like symptoms or maybe even an official MECFS diagnosis following their COVID infections. Thank you again so much for everything you have done to help our MECFS community thus far, Senator Markey. We look forward to continuing to have you as our champion on Capitol Hill. Thank you, uh, Ashanti. And uh, Jamel, uh, if you would, I think people would love to hear about the misdiagnosis of MECFS and the disbelief of patients. So in <clears throat> thinking about misdiagnosis, you know, when I went to the doctor, they, um, they would run blood tests. I was complaining about these set of symptoms. They would run blood tests and they would come back what they considered normal. So based on that in the assessment of the symptoms, which was fatigue, as I was describing it, or sometimes I would say I was tired, the assumption was the blood, blood test suggests that they're, um, the, the, everything is going normally for me. So maybe, maybe it's depression, maybe it's anxiety. And so there's assumption that if we can't um, determine what is the biological feature, given the test that we have at this point, and remember, there is not a, a biological test for MECFS, then it must be psychiatric. So people are typically diagnosed with psychiatric disorders such as PSD, any of the range of depressive disorders, some of the anxiety disorders, or what's called somatization, which is where basically a person is faking it. If that doesn't happen, then the other piece is they're diagnosed with an, another chronic condition that might fit um, what's um, and <laughs> so again we're uh, pushing people into another direction instead of accepting that MECFS could be an, an actual problem so what ends up happening is people go from doctor to doctor to doctor trying to seek out a diagnosis and some relief because maybe the medications that were given for some other disease is not necessarily um, um, as effective or they're not necessarily satisfied with the interaction they're having with the doctor. There was one day where I, as part of my research, I asked people um, with MECFS to send me the comments that doctors have made about living with the disease. And some people have said to, um, to women in particular, oh, well, if you just have a baby, you'll, everything will be better. 
Um, some people have said to children, well, you came here, so that should be good enough. You should be able to go outside. And some people have said to men, <laughs> buck up, you should <clears throat> you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, and um, take care of yourself. Now, what ends up happening is as we go from system to system to try and get um, healthcare services, we are incurring costs on the system, but we're also incurring economic costs because some of us cannot work. And because some of us cannot work, we have to access um, other resources. And I looked this up and could not believe this, but among the people who right now have been identified um, with MECFS, we're talking about between 17 and $24 billion. What do you think is gonna happen with that number when other people, the COVID long hards, come into the system that's not prepared to deal with us? They'll have to, uh, again, try and seek out this diagnosis and they will also incur additional costs in the healthcare system simply because we have not up till, uh, till now had someone who's advocating for MECFS and pushed for research funding to address the, um, our needs. So misdiagnosis, it may seem like something that happens on an interpersonal level, but it has widespread social and economic implications. Well, Jamel, uh, thank you for your advocacy tonight and to Ashanti and Claudia and Rivka. So all I can tell you is I am your advocate, I am your partner, uh, and I am going to work uh, to make sure that we get the $60 million uh, so that we can do this research at NIH uh, so that someday children have to look to a history book to find that there ever was such a disease. But we have to get to the bottom of it. We have to do the research. Uh, we have to make sure that the funding is there. A vision without funding is an hallucination. We need the funding. We need to make sure <clears throat> that NIH uh, focuses upon this, does the work which is necessary. So I can't thank you all enough for stepping up, stepping out, being willing to raise the profile of this issue, uh, I am your partner in this effort. I can't thank you enough uh, for being willing uh, to be with me tonight to be able to explain to the thousands of people on uh, why we must get this funding and why COVID-19 might just exacerbate this problem mm -hmm. to a level yet unprecedented. And so, uh, because it has all of the makings of that, and we're already hearing from experts that that could happen. So I thank you all so much. Uh, and Rivka, so great to be with you, my friend, going back four yeah. years now in Northampton. But, uh, uh, and, and thank you for helping to organize this event tonight. Thank you so much, Senator Markey. We are indebted to you. And you fought for us, and now we want to fight for you. So thank you. Thank you, Rivka. Thank you to everybody who's on. And uh, just one more reason after hearing this tonight, stay safe out there. Protect yourself. Don't contract the COVID-19, but help to make sure that essential workers don't as well. You stay safe to help them stay safe. And I'm going to be down here in Washington over the next two weeks fighting to make sure uh, that we bring in the trillions of dollars we're going to need for testing, for contact tracing, uh, for personal protective equipment, for all of the hospitals, community health centers, to protect our schools so the children don't get it, the teachers don't get it. Uh, the president has just been absolutely criminally negligent and a racist in terms of how he is dealing with this issue. Uh, that's something Ashanti has made very, very clear here in terms of the racial disparities. So we thank all of you tonight. Stay safe and everybody at home, you stay safe as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. <laughs>